welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. I'm Naomi Fowler. Coming up later... The UK is the most corrupt country on earth. Anyone with a modicum of interest in corruption will tell you that the City of London is the biggest laundromat of corrupt money and black money and drug money that there is. The story of how a con man can devastate the lives of thousands, aided and abetted by the offshore industry. We'll also discuss the latest leak from the Bahamas and Apple's 13 billion euro unpaid tax bill. But first, here's a quick roundup of this month's tax justice news. The Ecuadorians have been shaking things up at the United Nations. They're calling for a global tax body with powers to tackle tax-dodging multinationals and shut down tax havens. Since the OECD's rich country club has been so slow and ineffective, a global tax body has been suggested and rejected before. But Ecuador's likely to be the next chair of the G77 nations, where they've promised to push their proposal hard. It's worth mentioning, though, that the former president of Ecuador's central bank, who also happens to be the cousin of Ecuador's president, was among those exposed by the Panama Papers, along with some high-profile public servants in Ecuador, including the former head of the intelligence service and the attorney general, who's still in post. In the United States, investors managing over $740 billion of assets have called for transparency over US American company ownership. According to them, secret company ownership's a risk to investors, and it's got no place in a modern economy. The fingerprints of big four accountancy firm Price Waterhouse Coopers are all over a number of high profile investigations at the moment, but that doesn't mean that they're about to be investigated. In the United States, the New York Attorney General's looking into irregularities in Exxon's accounting practices. Their auditors? Price Waterhouse Coopers. They're also the ones who arranged the minuscule tax deal Amazon made with Luxembourg's tax authorities behind closed doors, now being investigated in the European Union for alleged breach of state aid rules. It's also the subject of a landmark court case at the moment in the United States, which could land Amazon with a $1.5 billion fine. And in the United Kingdom, the former directors of supermarket chain Tesco's have been charged with fraud. Again, PricewaterhouseCoopers were their auditors. Denmark's just paid over a million dollars for data from an anonymous source on up to 600 Danes who may have evaded tax. It's likely to be a pretty good investment, and until we have greater transparency, leaks and whistleblowers will continue to be the main way of dealing with tax evasion and other crime that uses financial secrecy. Over 100 members of the European Parliament have just signed an open letter calling for protection for whistleblowers. Much needed. Those are the news headlines. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month's Tax Justice News. Right, John, so this month we've had a new leak. It's Bahamas leaks. So we've had Swiss leaks, Lux leaks, Panama Papers, now Bahamas leaks. So that's 1.3 million files from the Bahamian Corporate Registry. And uh, once again, thanks to a leak and the work of journalists, we discover how little we really seem to know about what the rich and the powerful and our politicians and public servants are up to offshore. And not only that, but yet again, it takes journalists and yet another leak to do what nation states should be doing, which is offering a free online and publicly searchable registry of offshore company data. Well, that's right. The Bahamas is a big story. The Bahamas themselves host something like 90,000 offshore companies, 6,000 or so trusts, plus foundations, investment funds. They are a huge player in the Latin American market. In other words, they are attracting dirty money and tax evading money from across the whole of the Latin Americas and also from North America as well. And this is a big story because whilst the Bahamian government claims that it is transparent and cooperative. In practice, its company registry is hopelessly out of date, doesn't have the necessary information about who are the real ultimate beneficial owners. It doesn't keep the information up to date. It doesn't capture sufficient information to make the registry useful. And 
So far, it has declined or refused to sign up to multilateral automatic information exchange. In fact, what it's done is it's signed up to the common reporting standard, which is the new global automatic information standard, but it has refused to do it on a multilateral basis, which means it's only signing deals, information exchange deals, with countries it's previously signed tax information exchange agreements with, and in many cases those countries are themselves tax havens. So the whole thing is something of a charade, so much so that The Economist has called the Bahamas the holdout, the one that's resisting international measures to become more transparent. The Bahamas thinks it can continue with its very secretive business model and just pretend to go through the motions of becoming cooperative. What I hope it up now is that the rest of the world, and particularly the United States, will recognise the Bahamas for what it is, a highly secretive and non-cooperative jurisdiction, and take appropriate action. Right, and uh, the Bahamas, is, uh, because it's going for the bilateral exchange approach, it means it's opting to select which countries it will deign to exchange its substandard information with, right? So I would imagine it's in no rush to uh, do exchange deals with countries from Latin America, for example. <laughs> well, that's absolutely right, because and we've seen this in the past, when the OECD came forward with its original tax information exchange agreements and with its hopeless black, grey and white list, it said that any jurisdiction that signs up to 12 tax information exchange agreements will automatically move from the grey list to the white list. And that was the worst thing to do because it just encouraged jurisdictions like the Bahamas to sign up tax information exchange agreements with Jersey and Guernsey and the other tax havens and with meaningless places like, no offence men, but Greenland with a tiny population which frankly doesn't use tax havens that much. So the whole thing became something of a farce and brought the OECD into enormous disrepute because of the weakness of this approach. And the Bahamas is still following that approach, which frankly is a decade out of date because by now I think Politically, the world has moved on, but unfortunately our politicians are not moving on fast enough, are not keeping up with what civil society demands of it. OK, let's uh, talk about a story that came out earlier this month, just before the Bahamas leaks. Apple's taxes, or lack of, so uh, they need to pay €13 billion Euros in underpaid taxes to Ireland. Just in 2014, Apple paid 0.005% tax on its billions of profits across Europe, Africa, India and the Middle East via Ireland. Thank you very much, Ireland. Turns out that was a breach of EU state aid and anti-competition rules, according to the European Commission. <laughs> Hooray for the uh, European Union Competition Commissioner, Margarethi Vestager, unlike the previous Competition Commissioner who was just exposed in Bahamas leaks. <laughs> Apple's CEO, as uh, in his usual style, called this ruling political crap. And uh, we've seen the might of the US corporate world and many US politicians lining up to condemn the EU ruling. We have an interesting situation as well where not only is Apple appealing that decision, but so is Ireland. First of all, Tim Cook describing the, uh, the EU rulings as political crap. Apple's choice to not pay tax in the countries where it sells its products is not a value-free decision. It is a very political choice because Apple deliberately, purposefully and for many decades has rejected the values and benefits that flow from democracy and fair markets. So to call this political crap reveals the, the politics of Apple and the politics of Mr. Cook himself, because one of the ironies of Apple, and this has been uh, discussed at length by an economist called Mariano Mazzucato in a book called The Entrepreneurial State, is that almost every single product that Apple have ever, ever put to market has depended upon enormous taxpayer investment in the underlying technologies, including, of course, the internet, GPS, touch screens, and all of those things, all of that funded by state and taxpayers. So the for Apple to opt out of paying taxes is particularly disgraceful at a moral level, but at a political level or an economic level, they are the classic case of a free-riding company. And one of the shocking things about it is that competition authorities haven't actually tackled this beforehand. Markets are being rigged. 
by big companies like Apple and their tax advisors and the countries like Ireland and Luxembourg that do these deals. And of course, the UK does these deals as well. The markets are being rigged deliberately and in a corrupt sort of way. And why do I say that it's corrupt? First of all, it's very much to the disadvantage of consumer choice. It also, of course, shifts the tax burden onto others. But at every single level, these dealings are distorting, they're harmful, and they're corrupt because they're so secretive and no one knows about them. And it's very possible that a lot of politicians are doing very well out of these rulings because, let's face it, a lot of politicians end up on the boards of these big companies. So... This story reveals the corrupt underbelly of contemporary capitalism. The 13 billion might sound like a huge sum of money, but actually it isn't that large a sum compared to the over $200 billion that Apple is holding offshore, not paying tax on because they don't want to repatriate that money to the United States. The layers of subsidy that have been given to multinational companies for decades by big countries like US and Ireland and others, are now being revealed to the public and you can see how corrupt the whole thing has become. And the levels of taxation being paid by corporations, multinationals around the world, has been dropping steadily since the early 1990s. And if we're not careful, we're living in the last years of corporate taxation, which is exactly the way they want it. And so this really is a defining moment, this appeal what happens as a result in terms of the world big capital wants versus democratic checks and balances, I guess. Well, that's right. One of the reasons why the corporate income tax is so important is because it is one of the last remaining taxes on wealth and capital. In the last few decades, we've seen all the tax charge being placed upon labour and on consumers. And not surprisingly, guess what? Inequality has risen, is continuing to rise, not just because wage rates are falling, but also because the ability of states to transfer wealth through the tax system is being reduced. So this poses a fundamental threat to capitalism itself. Removing the corporate income tax can only make matters very significantly worse. So this is a kind of last chance for the global politicians, for the IMF, for the OECD, to decide that tax competition is a really harmful phenomenon and political measures now must be taken against it. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. This month, the TaxCast goes to Paraguay in South America to tell a cautionary tale of how a con man can devastate the lives of thousands of ordinary people using offshore financial vehicles aided and abetted by the global corruption services industry. Banks, law firms, accountants, all happy to look the other way and not ask questions. Back in 1964, the Brazilian and Paraguayan dictatorships at the time signed a treaty agreeing to exploit the vast water resources between their two nations for their mutual growing electricity needs. And that's where our story begins. The Paraná River is 4,880 kilometres long. Of all Latin America's rivers, only the Amazon can beat that. In 1973, the Brazilians and the Paraguayans signed a second treaty behind closed doors, agreeing to build the Itaipu Dam. The deal was massively to the advantage of Paraguay's huge, powerful neighbour, Brazil, and the Brazilians ensured its one-sided continuation for 30 years by paying off Paraguayan elites. They finally agreed a fairer deal with Paraguay in 2009. But that's another story. The huge construction project began in 1975, As high as a 65-storey building, the Itaipu Dam is known as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. Around 40,000 people worked on the construction project, and that's where we come to our story. The Itaipu Dam workers had a retirement fund they paid into over the decades they worked on the dam called La Caja Paraguaya de Jubilaciones y Pensiones del Personal de la Itaipu Binacional, or CAHUBI for short. 
the dam was already finished and it was generating, you know, huge amounts of power. This is Alec Boyd, an investigative journalist and asset recovery specialist. So once the dam was already completed, the workers' pensions funds of the workers of the dam were just sitting there and they'd been sitting in a large pool of money. Then along came a man called Marcelo Barone, along with his partner, Elisabel Vasquez, both Venezuelan nationals, although they also hold European passports. I do not know how Barone and Vasquez became involved with Paraguayan authorities tasked with safeguarding the investments of these workers' funds. He presented himself as this big investment and expert in oil negotiations, oil contract, procurement contracts, but I couldn't corroborate this with independent sources anywhere. Apart from a dodgy website, there was no evidence anywhere that this man had a track record as an investment specialist. He also said that he had a PhD from Georgetown University, which I haven't found any, any evidence of it anywhere. And this Venezuelan couple approached uh, Paraguayan authorities with the promises of, of high return investment in international assets and, and investments in different stocks in different portfolios across the world. The lack of any evidence to back up the stories Baroni and Vasquez told didn't seem to deter Cahubi, the workers' pension fund, and so in 2006 they gave Baroni $4 million for supposedly high-return investments. The following year they gave him another $32 million. So he lands in Paraguay and he offers these this, uh, fantastic returns to these uh, Paraguayan authorities and he is given th- effectively $37 million to invest without having signed one bit of paper. There is not one contract with his signature and the signatures of the Paraguayan authorities allowing for the transfer of this money to be invested abroad, which is unheard of. Uh, how, how could you give someone $37 million without even signing a receipt? When the promised returns didn't materialize, then, you know, all the red alerts start ringing. As it turns out, it wasn't only the money given to Baroni and Vasquez that disappeared. A total of at least $134 million of supposed investments outside Paraguay in places like Canada also never came back. Many years and investigations later, a number of people at the top of the tree in Kahubi, the Itaipu Dam Workers Pension Fund, were sent to jail, including two former directors. Here's the judge in a Paraguayan court reading out the sentences. Some of them got 14 years in prison. Such stiff penalties for white-collar criminals is rare in any country, and you can hear the sounds of shock in the background. Condenar a los acusados. Victor Daniel Bogado Núñez y Damián Escurra Vicésar a la pena privativa de libertad de 14 años. Walter Elías Delgado Añasco, Félix Juan Bautista Villamayor y César Amil Cabejarano a la pena privativa de libertad de 12 años. Ricardo Antonio Poletti Pereira a la pena privativa de libertad de 10 años. Back to our man Marcelo Baroni. We now know the funds Kahubi gave him went straight into a Panamanian company registered by Baroni. And as you can imagine, it didn't stay there for long. And news of Baroni's extravagant lifestyle reached London based Alec Boyd. A Venezuelan himself, he's particularly keen on investigating stolen state funds and public money from the region. London keeps him pretty busy. The UK is the most corrupt country on earth. Anyone with a modicum of interest in corruption will tell you that the city of London is the biggest laundromat of corrupt money and black money and drug money that there is. So he landed here in London eventually. And a Venezuelan who lives in London that I know contacted me and said, what do you know about this person? Because he recently came to London He's buying property in Park Lane, in St. James, and he's driving around brand new Ferraris. And he's asking for my help 
Maroni was asking for his help for introductions and to do, you know, networking here in London. So he wanted me to sort of run a, a due diligence check on this Barone person. Around the same time, he became aware that this Marcelo Barone was the same person under investigation by the Paraguayan authorities and that an award-winning journalist in Paraguay was covering the story of the stolen workers' pension funds. Everyone was trying to track him down. So when the Paraguayan media published about this investigation, then we sort of realized, oh, wow, this is the same man that was mentioned as some Venezuelan to have just landed in London and started buying multi-million pound properties in prime locations. Obviously, there is something going on. So I communicated with ABC Color, which is the largest newspaper in Paraguay, basically availing myself to any searches for information that they would like to pursue here in the UK. Along with other investigative journalists in Paraguay, Alec did some digging. And the Paraguayan authorities were very much on the case too. And when governments do decide to request information, they get a lot further than journalists can. A whistleblower inside Kahubi also gave crucial information on the original money transfers. To cut a long story short, the workers' pension money ended up in the United States, Switzerland and the United Kingdom via company accounts with the Bank of America, Dresdner Bank and Citibank. Alec found nine Panamanian registered companies, two companies in Florida, one in the United Kingdom, a Guernsey registered company, and at least one more UK registered company. He was operating openly with total freedom. No one was questioning him. And the issue here is because the funds were originated from an official entity in Paraguay, obviously when an official entity transfers money internationally to whoever, there is no question about the origin of the money because it comes from an official institution. And that is why these people are able to operate with total freedom because when they come and open bank accounts anywhere in Europe, he is a European citizen, he is Italian, and his uh, partner in crime is Spanish. So whenever they go, they can present themselves saying, we're upstanding, legitimate businessmen, we're doing business with this official institution over in Paraguay, they're going to be transferring this amount of millions to us. The problem is that the banks over here, they just don't know what kind of deals they have with those institutions in other countries. That's the bit that needs to be improved in due diligence, in anti money laundering processes, is to make sure that this is not you know, a quid pro quo, I pay a bribe over here and you transfer so many millions over there. And these are the banks that are supposed to ask questions, uh, know your client. And <laughs> yeah. they, they, they do ask questions when you are uh, involved in, uh, I don't know, paying into your bank account 3,000 euros. But when we're talking millions or hundreds of millions or, you know, tens of millions, no questions are asked. They have private bankers, private wealth managers that are exclusively dealing with this sort of clients. And I don't think they're asking many questions or pertinent questions at all. And so it may have been as simple as that for Marcelo Barone to get all that money out of Latin America and put it wherever he wanted. But if he'd needed a more, let's say, personalised service, there are plenty of law firms, banks and company and corporation service providers to assist him. To avoid any trouble in getting the Paraguayan workers' pension money out of Panama, Marcelo Baroni might have opted for a specialised secretive bank transfer service rather than a standard bank transfer. We know from the Panama Papers scandal that law firm Mossack Fonseca was charging clients a fee of 0.5% of the total amount transferred for that kind of thing. If they'd acted for Barone, that means just for shifting the first $4 million of Kahubi's pension fund money, they'd have made $20,000 for a service that could have been done using a normal bank transfer. And of course, for transferring the $32 million he was given after that, their fee would have been $160,000. Then there's the matter of obscuring his ownership of his many companies and their offshore accounts. No problem. 
There's the nominee director system, which will supply him with a front man or woman. These front people can be nominee directors of thousands of companies and are often paid peanuts while pulling in fat fees for the law firms. One of Mossack Fonseca's prolific nominee directors was called Letitia Montoya. Panama Papers journalist Bastian Obermeyer was involved in tracking her down in Panama to ask about the 25,000 companies she was supposed to be directing. Those persons like Leticia Montoya, who we met in, in Panama, we were at her house, she doesn't have a clue. They have to direct thousands of companies. How would they know all that's going on inside there? So it's very clearly only a service to hide the traces of the real owners and the persons who in reality direct the companies. I mean, it's kind of completely obvious. How can you be the director of 25,000 companies like Leticia Montoya was. How can you do this? It's not possible. You have a lot of work if you direct one company or maybe 10, maybe 15, but more than 100? Come on, that's not possible. To reassure the real owners of these companies, these front people sign three documents. Number one, the nominee director declaration. This is an assurance that the front person will follow the instructions of the real owner at all times and that they don't have any claims against them or the company. Second, a power of attorney document that recognises the true owner as the real director. And third, the front person signs a resignation letter, which is passed on to the real owner. There's no date at the top, meaning the real owner can get rid of the pretend owner at any time, even retrospectively. We also know from the Panama Papers that law firm Mossack Fonseca was getting its nominee directors to pre-sign all sorts of documents they could use to open new accounts, make transfers, acquire shares, purchase property, create new powers of attorney, close companies. And then they were getting their nominee directors, their front people, to sign completely empty sheets of paper, which could be used for absolutely anything. Banks were not only aware of this, but knowingly participated. Deutsche Bank, for example, didn't want nominee directors in Panama knowing the identity of their clients. So Mossack Fonseca, the law firm in Panama, sent them all kinds of blank documents. Powers of attorney signed by nominee directors, pre-signed account opening documents. It's fascinating and you can read more on all that in the excellent book, The Panama Papers, breaking the story of how the rich and powerful hide their money. It's written by Frederick and Bastian Obermeyer and published by One World. I talked to both of them in the July 2016 tax cast. Take a listen. Anyway, back to our man Marcelo Baroni. Eventually, international arrest warrants were issued. The Paraguayan authorities were tenacious. Alec Boyd. The phenomenal thing is that they came over to the UK to liaise with authorities in the UK and to try and find out more about the activities of this couple. And eventually the UK authorities did help them with the investigation. And the proof of the fact is that both of them were arrested in London and are sitting in jail waiting for extradition to Paraguay. And they're still there now fighting extradition. And what happened to the workers' pension fund money? They, they basically lost, lost their money. They, they've, they've lost their pensions. So I don't, I don't know whether the Paraguayan government and with the Brazilian government are going to replenish this fund. I, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, but you know, I wouldn't put too much hope on it. And there is very little chance of them recovering the 37 million. There is no political will not only in the first world, but in the developed nations to put a stop to this. And the man in the street is the one that's suffering because corruption does have an impact, not only over there, but over here as well. The price of the property in London has gone through the roof. Why? Because, you know, a lot of the corrupt of the world are laundering their money here. And that's why the prices over here are like they are in New York, in Madrid, in Paris, is the same all over the place. And then in developing nations where the funds are being stolen, then they don't have food, they don't have electricity, they don't have housing, they don't have social services, they, are, they have no safety net to fall back on. So it's, it's, it's an anguishing situation. 
there's no good business reason for anonymous ownership of companies, none. And we must make trusts and foundations transparent too. You can read Alec Boyd's stories on www.alecboyd.blogspot.co.uk. That's Boyd, spelt B-O-Y-D. That's it from us from the Taxcast this month. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next month. Thank you.